Okay, guys, we're back in action, all right? Thank you so much for being here. I am so uh, excited for this study and to spend this time with you together. This is going to launch us into a whole new area uh, of the Word of God and, and truth. And as you know, we have finished the book of Romans, and we took, took, have taken a little time off. And so we're back and, and jumping into the deep end of the pool and, and, and ready to, to, to swim through an incredible book in the Bible, which is the book of 1 John. And, and this book has had enormous impact in my life and ministry in the past. And that's not really the reason I'm doing this. Um, I just think that this is the book we need to study. The truths that are contained in this book uh, really has to be um, at the head of our list. So, and it's so different from Romans, different author, different focus, and so this is not going to be an overlap with, with Romans. This is going to be um, in tandem with the book of Romans. So, uh, welcome. For those of you who have never been in our Bible study before, we're thrilled that you're here. Please continue to come back. We're going to be here, I think, for the next, um, next three Thursdays in a row. So we're going to just be laying down uh, uh, some truth. Uh, today, we're going to be doing a survey, <clears throat> an introduction to the book of 1 John. And next week, Lord willing, we'll be starting the verse-by-verse -verse journey through this book. But uh, I need to begin in a word of prayer. And I do want to welcome those who are watching us on live stream. I, I literally have friends on both uh, Atlantic and Pacific coasts who are joining us, as well as in the heartland, the Gulf of Mexico, just everywhere, and we know people are joining us around the world uh, for this study. So welcome, uh, pray for us, we'll pray for you uh, as we go through this study. So let's just begin in a word of prayer. Father in heaven, we are excited to look into your word today. We are so grateful to have the record of divine inspiration that has been recorded by the Apostle John for the instruction of our Christian lives. And none of us have arrived. We all need uh, greater measures of truth, not just in our head, but in our heart and, and in our lives. So we ask God that you would use this study to our profit. We pray this in Christ's name. Amen. Okay, take your Bible, be turning to the book of 1 John, and there's one verse that's going to be a launching point for us, and that's 1 John 5 and verse 13. Every book in the Bible has a signature text uh, that the whole book wraps around, and 1 John 5 verse 13 is that verse for us in the book of 1 John, and I want to begin by just reading this, and you'll understand why I've entitled this first study, <clears throat> Absolute Assurance, Absolute Assurance, because that's what this book is all about. The Apostle John, as he comes to the last chapter of this book, looks back upon what he has written to this point. And he says, these things I have written to you, and that encompasses everything to this point, as well as the final verses. These things I have written to you who believe in the name of the Son of God. Here's the purpose, so that you may know that you have eternal life. This is a book all about knowing that you know the Lord. We could put it this way, the Gospel of John was written so that you would know how to be saved. John 20, verses 30 and 31 tell us the purpose of the gospel of John. First John is written to tell us how we may know that we have truly believed in Jesus Christ. And this is critically important. And by way of beginning, this book is all about how do you know that you know the Lord? How do you know that you know the Lord? And so the whole argument of, of this book of 1 John is how to have a true assurance of your salvation. 
Now, this is critically important for several reasons, and I'm going to give you three reasons why this is very important that you have a, a no-so salvation, that, that you know that you know the Lord. And, and the first is, is that every true believer needs to have the true assurance of his salvation in order to live an effective and dynamic Christian life. I mean, you can't move forward in your Christian life if you've got the emergency brake on, and you, you're just having doubts. Am I in? Am I out? Uh, there's no way you can serve the Lord with any effectiveness if you don't know whose side you're on, if you don't know if you're a missionary or if you're the mission field. I mean, you need to know whether you're in Christ or if you're not in Christ. Yeah, you can't worship the Lord, really, with, with heartfelt devotion unless you know that you know the Lord. So, in order to live an effective Christian life, a dynamic Christian life, you must have the assurance of your salvation. Second, only God can give you assurance of salvation. It, it's really an inside job. Um, no pastor can give you assurance of salvation. It doesn't matter if he writes his name in the back of your Bible and puts the date when, when you prayed with him. Uh, no evangelist can give you assurance of salvation. He's only a man. Um, no, no parent can give you assurance of salvation. No confirmation class when you're 12 years old can give you assurance of salvation. Um, no church. No team of elders can give you assurance of salvation. Only God can give you assurance of salvation. And I want to walk you through this train of thought. The Holy Spirit who convicted you of sin. The Holy Spirit who called you out of darkness and into the light. The Holy Spirit who regenerated your spiritually dead soul. The Holy Spirit who gave you the gifts of repentance and faith. The Holy Spirit who sealed you in Christ. Uh, the Holy Spirit who baptized you and placed you into the body of Christ. The Holy Spirit who sanctified you at the moment of your regeneration. The Holy Spirit who moment by moment is sanctifying you. The Holy Spirit who indwells you is the Holy Spirit who gives you assurance of salvation. He, he hasn't brought you this far to just leave you on your own. The Holy Spirit gives assurance of salvation to true believers. And if you do not have assurance of salvation, that should be cause for great concern. Because wherever the Holy Spirit indwells a life, he is bearing testimony to that heart and life that you belong to Jesus Christ. Now, that does not mean that there cannot be a, a momentary, uh, let's say, season of doubt or self-examination and questioning. And the Bible tells us to examine ourselves, whether we be in the faith, 2 Corinthians 13, 5. However, big picture... Not micro, but macro. Big picture. The main thrust of your life, the Holy Spirit indwells every true believer, and He bears witness with those believers that you belong to Jesus Christ. Uh, 1 John 3 and verse 24, we'll get to that verse eventually, says, we know by this that He abides in us. We know that the Holy Spirit and Jesus Christ abides in us. How? By the Spirit whom He has given. And so it is the Holy Spirit's office work. It is the Holy Spirit's ministry to persuade and convince your heart with strong testimony and witness that you belong to Jesus Christ if you are a true believer. And Romans 8 and verse 16 is another extraordinary verse that, that we need to hear. Listen to Romans 8 verse 16. 
the Spirit Himself, and the word Himself indicates that it's not the Spirit and a pastor, a Spirit and an evangelist, a Spirit and a, a, a parent. No, the Spirit Himself, solo, sola Spirit, the Spirit Himself testifies with our spirit, meaning our human spirit, on the inside that we are children of God. And so, God alone can give you assurance of salvation, and it always accompanies the new birth. And the book of 1 John has more to say about the new birth explicitly than any other book in the Bible. Let me repeat that. The book of 1 John has more to say about the new birth explicitly than any other book in the Bible. Let me just give you some verses. 1 John 2, 29. You know that everyone who practices righteousness is born of Him. 1 John 3, 9. No one who is born of God practices sin. 1 John 4, 7. Everyone who loves is born of God. 1 John 5, 1. Whoever believes that Jesus is the Christ is born of God. 1 John 5, 4. Whatever is born of God overcomes the world. 1 John 5, 18. We know that no one who is born of God practices sin. So, this book is really about the new birth and the evidence of that new birth that accompanies the miracle of salvation. We could put it this way. If the new birth is the root, a changed life will be the fruit. And there's an inseparable connection between the root and the fruit. A good root will produce good fruit. And the good root is regeneration. It is the new birth. And it will always produce a bumper crop of fruit in the life of the one who has been born again. That will be the whole argument of this book. Now, there's a third reason why this is so important. Number one, you have to know that you're saved in order to be effective in your Christian life. Second, we said that only God can give you this assurance. And here's the third reason why this is so important. Many people have a false assurance of a salvation they do not possess. And that's the hardest person in the world to reach with the gospel. It would be easier to reach the harlot than to reach the unconverted church member. And so, Jesus talked about that in Matthew 7, 21. Not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, shall enter the kingdom of heaven. And there are countless people who have a dead testimony. They have the words, but they do not have the reality. Uh, they are tares among the wheat. They are Judases among the twelve. They are bad fish caught in the same net with the good fish. They are foolish virgins who did not trim their lamps among the wise virgins who did trim their lamps. And I would say, big picture, um, wherever there is a church, whatever that church is, when you pull it all together, there are more unconverted people in church than are genuinely converted. So, this is a very important subject that we're addre addressing. It's like who's in and who's out. It's like who really is saved and who is bringing an empty testimony and an empty profession of faith in Christ. And according to 1 John, you can know and you should know that you have eternal life. So, the key word in the book of 1 John, and this is going to be the point of the day right here, is the word no, know, K-N-O-W. It is found, there's two different Greek words that are used in 1 John for, for no, know, K-N-O-W. 
it is found, there's no other book in the entire Bible that has the repetition of one word so many times. It is found not 10 times, not 20 times, not 30 times. It's found 40 times in five chapters. And right now, I want to quickly take us through the book of 1 John. And I, with my pen, I've actually drawn a circle around all 40 of these uh, appearances of the word no, just so that my eye can clearly lock in and see it. And I want you to follow with me. I just want to impress upon you this word no, uh, which means to be deeply convinced of a reality, to rightly perceive of something. So, in 1 John 2, it starts in verse 3. In fact, in this verse, the word no is used twice. By this we know that we have come to know Him. How can you know if you have come to know Him? This is one of the nine tests in the book of 1 John. If we keep His commandments. Verse 4, the one who says, I've come to know Him and does not keep His commandments is a liar. Meaning it's a false testimony. You may not be aware of it, but you're just lying through your teeth to say you're a Christian and that you know the Lord. And the truth is not in him. The gospel has not yet been received. Look at verse 5. But whoever keeps his word, in him the love of God has truly been perfected. By this we know that we are in him. Look at verse 11. The one who hates his brother is in the darkness and walks in the darkness and does not know where he is going. That's how lost he is. He doesn't know that he does not know. That's as lost as you can be. Look at verse 13. It's twice in verse 13, different levels of spiritual maturity. I'm writing to you fathers. That's referring to those who are the most mature in their faith because you know him who has been from the beginning. You have this eternal perspective of God. But at the end of the verse, I have written to you children because you know the Father. Baby Christians know God as Daddy, Father. They, they, they just have a very immature relationship with God, but it is the elder statesman in the body of Christ. It's the most mature who know God, not just as Father, but Him who has been from the beginning. You have grown to have a bigger, grander view of who God is. Now, look at verse 14. I have written to you fathers because you know Him who has been from the beginning. Now, look at verse 18. Children, and by the way, everyone was a child to John. He's in his 90s probably as he, as he writes this. So, uh, everyone is, is, uh, is a young child to him. Children, it is the last hour, and just as you have heard that Antichrist is coming, even now many Antichrists have appeared. From this we know that it is the last hour. Verse 20, but, but you have an anointing from the Holy One, and you all know. You, you know the essential truths because you have the, the teacher indwelling you, the Holy Spirit. Look at verse 21. It's mentioned twice. I have not written to you because you do not know the truth, but because you do know it. Everyone who is born again has the indwelling Holy Spirit who is the author of Scripture and who is the primary teacher of Scripture, and He is enlightening you and illuminating the truth inside your mind, you don't need these other false teachers to give you any insight. And I'm going to talk about these false teachers in a little bit. No, you have the true teacher, the Holy Spirit inside of you, and you know the truth. Look at verse 29 at the end of the chapter. Now, this is an important verse. If you know that He, referring to Jesus, who's coming end of the previous verse, if you know that He is righteous, you know that everyone who practices righteousness is born of Him. <laughs> it's obvious. They're on a different path than those who have just a dead testimony, who, who are just like dead fish floating downstream. But the true believer is practicing righteousness from the heart. 
And he's headed in a totally different direction. It's not the perfection of his life. He'll never attain that in this world. It's not the perfection. It's the direction of his life. He's headed in a totally different direction. Look at, look at the next verse. John 3, 1, see how great a love the Father has bestowed on us, that we should be called children of God, and such we are. For this reason, the world does not know us, because it did not know Him. The world cannot figure us out, because the world could not figure out the Lord Jesus Christ. If the world can figure you out, that is a danger sign. You should be an enigma to unbelievers, that they cannot quite understand how you operate, what your priorities are, why your values are so different. You should be one big question mark to the world. Now, look at verse 5, 1 John 3. And I just want you to see the word no. I hope you're circling it in your Bible. And by the way, it's okay to write in your Bible. <laughs> it's not the original autograph. Verse 5. You know that He appeared in order to take away sins, and in Him there is no sin. Verse 6, no one who abides in Him sins. No one who sins has seen Him or knows Him. And that word sins, that verb there, is in a verb tense that would indicate a lifestyle, habitual practice. Uh, look at verse 14. We know that we have passed out of death into life. That means you have passed out of the darkness into the light. You have passed out of the kingdom of this world into the kingdom of God. You, you have passed from being lost to being saved. That's what that means. We know that we have passed out of death into life because we love the brethren. He who does not love abides in death. Look at verse 15. Everyone who hates his brother is a murderer, and you know that no murderer has eternal life abiding in him. Look at verse 16. It's just almost every verse. We know love by this, that he laid down his life for us. Verse 19, we will know by this that we are of the truth. To be of the truth is to be converted, is to be regenerated, is to be saved and will assure our heart before Him. That's the inward work of the Holy Spirit giving assurance of salvation. It is the Holy Spirit who assures your heart before God. I cannot assure your heart. Man looks on the outward appearance. God looks on the heart. I don't know what's going on inside your heart. The Pharisees were geniuses at masking their heart. They looked phenomenal on the outside. They were phenomenal duds on the inside. So, look at verse 20. In whatever our heart condemns us, for God is greater than our heart and knows all things. So, it's not only that we know God, but God knows us. And not only that we know where our heart is with the Lord, but God knows where our heart is with the Lord. Look at verse 24. The one who keeps His commandments abides in Him, and He in Him. We know by this that He abides in us. How do you know that God is in your life? By the Spirit whom He has given. The continual focus is back on the indwelling Holy Spirit who gives you true assurance. Now, continue to look. Chapter 4, verse 2. By this you know the Spirit of God. In other words, you can know where the Spirit of God is at work. And by the way, this is the text that Jonathan Edwards preached um, at, um, at Yale in the midst of the Great Awakening in, uh, when, when the Great Awakening was exploding and there were old school, stuffy Harvard graduate professor, uh, pastors who looked down upon Jonathan Edwards and down upon George Whitfield and called them enthusiasts because their preaching had some energy to it, and they called for the new birth. And so there was much confusion. The Board of Trustees at, at, at Yale had just met the day before, and they couldn't quite sort this all out. Where is God at work? What is a true revival? And what is a false revival? And by the providence of God, the next day, Jonathan Edwards addressed 
not only the student body, but the board of trustees, and he brought clarity to the whole issue on what is a genuine work of God in a person. And his text was right here, 1 John 4, 1 through 6. I wish I had time to go through it. It eventually became a book with the title, The Distinguishing Marks of a Work of God. And there are six distinguishing marks of a work of God that separates a true church from a false church, a true believer from a false believer. Just because church is on the sign doesn't mean it's a true church. And just because someone professes Christ or is a member of a church doesn't mean you've been born again. So, verse 2 is, is one of these. By this you know the Spirit of God. This is how you know where He's at work. Every spirit... And that tells us there is a spirit behind every preacher and behind every teacher. A small s that's driving him. It's either the de a demon or it is the Holy Spirit. It's one of the two. Every spirit that confesses that Jesus Christ has come in the flesh is from God. And I'm going to explain that later, what, what that actually means. But... This is another way you know that you're a true believer. You have believed in a true Christ. You have not believed in a false Christ. Your faith is no greater than the object of your faith. A drowning man can put faith in a piece of straw and it's not going to help him. It's only if your faith is in the right object will you be rescued. And so you must believe that Jesus has come in the flesh and that he is sent from God. Now, let's keep, let's keep looking. Um, in, in verse 6, it's twice. We know from, we, excuse me, we are from God. He who knows God listens to us. You know, I'm not an infallible interpreter of Scripture, and I'm not an infallible um, teacher. But on the essentials, I'm spot on. And if you disagree with me on the gospel, you're lost. And if you agree with me, you're saved. And it's pretty easy on gospel issues. And we're not just dogmatic about this, we're bulldogmatic about this. And so John says, we, referring to the apostles, we are from God. And he who knows God listens to us. You drink in the truth. The one who is not from God does not listen to us. By this we know the spirit of truth and the spirit of error. So, the Holy Spirit is discriminating. And he discriminates between believers and false believers. The spirit of truth and the spirit of error. And he's always sifting through the wheat and the tares, even before the final judgment. Now, verse 7. Beloved, let us love one another, for love is from God. And everyone who loves is born of God and knows God. If you don't love the brethren, you're lost. You have a different family. You belong to a different family, the family of the devil. Because everyone who is part of the family of God, you love your brothers and you love your sisters. Uh, some of them may be a challenge to love at times, admittedly. Um, to live up above with those that we love, that will be glory. But to live down below with those that we know, that's another story. <laughs> But nevertheless, God gives a supernatural love to the brethren, to true believers, to love other believers. And let me just tell you this, the greater the persecution, the greater the love will be. Now, look at verse 8. The one who does not love does not know God. That means you're lost, unconverted, unregenerate. Because where God lives in a life... He gives the fruit of the Spirit, which is love. Now, verse 13. By this we know that we abide in Him. That's another way of saying, by this we know that we're in Christ. And He in us. 
because he has given us of his spirit. Verse 16, we have come to know and have believed the love which God has for us. If you're truly persuaded, excuse me, if you're truly saved, you know that God loves you. He's more than documented his love for you. By sending his son to die upon the cross, and you believe that he died for me upon that cross, that he bore my sins in his body upon the cross, that he took my sins far away, that he washed my guilty soul with his blood, and I am now faultless as I stand before the Lord. <laughs> you doubt the love of God for you? Then I doubt you've ever been saved. Because if you've been saved, you have seen with the eyes of faith the love of God supremely manifested to you in that God gave His only Son to die upon the cross for you. I, I think some people think it's kind of pseudo-spiritual to say, well, I have these doubts. No, that hadn't come from the Holy Spirit. That's come from either your flesh or that's come from another source. Let's keep looking at this. Uh, come to chapter 5. And, and this doesn't stop, by the way. And I, I just want you to see this as we put our little toe into the book of 1 John. This is what this book is all about. I, I just want you to see this from 36,000 feet before we walk the land. Chapter 5, verse, uh, verse 2. By this we know that we love the children of God when we love God and observe His commandments. Verse 13, these things I've written to you who believe in the name of the Son of God that you may know that you have eternal life. Verse 15, it's in here twice. And if we know that He hears us in whatever we ask, we know that we have the requests which we have asked from Him. This is one of the assurances of salvation. It's answered prayer. God doesn't answer the prayer of the devil's children. There's no relationship. God's not their father. The devil is their father. They can pray all day long, and their prayers will go no higher than the light bulbs. But for a true Christian, you have a connection with the throne of grace. You have a mediator at the right hand of God the Father. And when you pray, your prayers are getting through. When you pray, you see evidences of answered prayer in your life, that is a confirmation that you are rightly connected to the one who is seated on the throne of grace. It becomes one of the great evidences of, for assurance of salvation, that you have your prayers answered, because unbelievers do not have their prayers answered. Continue to look at this. Look at verse, um, uh, verse 18. We know that no one who is born of God sins. That should be best translated, practices sin. Talking about a habitual lifestyle, just lives on the broad road. But he who was born of God, that, that actually is referring to the virgin birth of Christ, keeps him, and the evil one does not touch him. It's another way you can know that you're truly saved is you don't walk away from the Lord because Christ, who was born of God, the virgin birth, keeps you and holds you. You have eternal security in Christ. You, you may think you've tried to let go, but Christ will never let go of you. That's what that says. He, capital H, he who was, verse 18, who was born of God, keeps him. The him refers to the one who's born of God as um, meaning you and me. And the evil one does not touch him. You are untouchable. Verse, uh, verse 19, we know that we are of God and the whole world lies in the power of the evil one. Verse 20, it's twice. And we know that the Son of God has come and has given us understanding so that we may know Him who is true. We just looked at all 40 
uses of the word know in the book of 1 John. The Greek word ido is used 15 times. The Greek word gnosko is used 25 times. That's a total of 40 times. It's the golden thread that runs through the book of 1 John. Again, the gospel of John is written that you may know how to be saved. 1 John tandems with it perfectly. It's how you may know that you have been saved. So, in the brief time that I have that remains, that, all that was the introduction, okay? <laughs> so, in the brief time that I have, I have two headings to put in front of you, and I may only have time for one. I don't know. The first is the polemic element. The polemic element. There is a polemic element to this book of First John there's a polemic element to every epistle in the New Testament, all 21. The word polemic means a strong attack against someone or something. And it produces a controversial debate and dispute. That's what the word polemic means. And I think of Titus 1 verse 9, an elder must be able to teach sound doctrine and to refute those who contradict. You have to have a two-edged sword. John Calvin said, every preacher and every teacher must have two voices, one to address the sheep and the other to rebuke the wolves. And what John will do in this book, really as he addresses the sheep, but he will rebuke the wolves. And there is a heresy that is spreading through the early church And we need to talk about it because you will not understand the book of 1 John unless you understand the historical background. The false teaching that was spreading through the early church was known as Gnosticism. I'm going to spell it for you. G-N-O-S-T-I-C-I-S-M. And it comes from a Greek word, gnosis, G-N-O-S-I-S, which means knowledge. And that's one of the words that's been used in this entire book for no. The Gnostics were a, a heresy that was spreading through the church at the end of the first century. And wherever God is at work, The devil's going to be setting up camp next door. And the Gnostics claimed that they had special knowledge. That's why they're called Gnostics, knowledge. They claimed they were receiving private messages from God. God told me. They, they, They claimed that they had insider information that the rest of the body of Christ did not have. They claimed that they were receiving mystical insights. They were feeling it. They claimed that they were having spiritual intuition. Sounds like the health, wealth, and prosperity gospel to me. And so they claimed they had this knowledge. And they used it to elevate themselves above everyone else in the church. Oh, you mean God's not talking to you? He's talking to me. All you have is the Bible? Oh, what a pity. You need me for this extra knowledge, and this extra knowledge will actually help you understand the Bible even better, and it will fill in some of the gaps that are missing in the Bible. It's very prevalent today. In charismatic circles, Pentecostal circles, health, wealth, gospel, there's no gospel circles, this intuitive private little messages I'm getting that no one else is getting. Now, let me tell you four things about Gnosticism, and this may be all the time that that we have. Number one, they held to what's called dualism. And you've got to understand this or you're not going to understand the book of 1 John, okay? You're just going to be glossing over the surface of 1 John. They held to dualism. You say, what's dualism? Well, it's like a Greek philosophy. 
and it essentially said this, everything that is a physical matter is either evil or non-consequential. Everything that is unseen spirit, small s, is, is good. So they make this distinction between the physical and the spiritual. That, that's really the key that's going to unlock our understanding of Gnosticism. Now, the second thing is, and it's the logical conclusion. You got to think with me on this. Number two, they rejected the humanity of Christ. Okay? They rejected the humanity of Christ because Jesus had a physical body. They said it would only seemed like he had a body, but he didn't have a body. So they denied the virgin birth. That's impossible for someone uh, who, who, who believes in dualism. So they denied the virgin birth. They denied the sinless life that Jesus lived without sin under the law and kept the law perfect in his human body. Now, keep going down this track with me. They denied the cross, the death of Christ. You have to have a body to die, right? So they denied the crucifixion of Jesus Christ. And some of them said that the Holy Spirit descended on Jesus at his baptism and left him right before the cross, which is another little corrupted twist among some of them. But the point is there's no way Jesus died upon a cross. Further, keep tracking with me, he was not raised from the dead. He had no resurrection body. So it was a frontal assault on the essentials of the Christian faith, the person and work of Christ. And they had some conf off-brand, contorted view of the deity of Christ. They would have to as well. So they denied that Jesus came in the flesh. They deny that he was born of a virgin. So that's the second thing that it leads to. Then third, and, and this is the next logical step, they were indifferent to moral values. They said, well, what you do in your body doesn't matter, does it? All that matters is your spirit. All that matters is your heart. It doesn't matter your physical body. In fact, your body is only a prison that holds captive your human spirit. And so, personal sin committed in your body has no effect upon your human spirit. There, there, there is this firewall between the physical and the spiritual. And so, what you do in the physical realm has no backdoor effect into your inner life, your inner soul. So, therefore, you can claim to be a believer in Jesus, and you can live however you want to live. All that matters is that you profess to believe in Jesus. But it doesn't matter how you live. And so, sin is really unimportant. You don't need to confess your sin. Why would you want to confess your sin? You don't need to repent of sin. Why would you repent of sin? You don't have to believe in a cross that actually takes away sin. Just, just live however you want to live. That's what the Gnostics were, were teaching. And it still comes into Christianity and in churches today. That little Johnny walked an aisle when he was eight years old and he prayed a prayer in front of the church with the pastor. And if you ever doubt his salvation, why, that's not of the Lord. And little Johnny can just go off to high school and live like the devil, and he can go off to college and live like the devil, and he can be a single until he's 30 years old and just live like the devil and lust for the world. That when he was eight years old, he prayed this little prayer. You can just live however you want to. The book of 1 John slams that door shut. 
in the face of anyone who would be so duped and so deceived as to believe you could profess to know Christ and your life has never changed? You could claim to be born again and have a new mind and a new heart and a new will and a new disposition and new desires and new attitudes and your life never changed? Come on. I've got the Brooklyn Bridge I'd love to sell you. You've been watching too much Christian television. That's Gnosticism. And it's with us today. And the fourth and final thing I'd tell you about Gnosticism is their message was well received by the world. They are popular. They will help you be successful and healthy and wealthy. And you can pamper your flesh and will help stroke your ego. And you can have the Lord, and you can have the world, and you can have, you can have it all. You can play both, both ends of the aisle, both sides of the aisle. You don't have to leave the world. You don't have to burn bridges behind you. And so, these Gnostic preachers were so popular. Everyone wanted to hear this message. I mean, you don't even have to be a good preacher to sell this product. Uh, this is great. And so, that's why it says in 1 John 4, verse 5, (laughs) they speak as from the world, and the world listens to them. When it says they speak from the world, that, that means they are pontificating what the world wants to hear. Me, myself, and I. And it comes through the music. It comes through the preaching. It comes through the testimonies. It it, it comes through everything, and the world eats it up. They are from the world, meaning they never left the world. They're still part of the system. Therefore, they speak as from the world, and the world listens to them. And John says, by contrast, in verse 6, We are from God, and he who knows God listens to us, not them, because you have the Holy Spirit inside of you, and there is a smoke alarm that goes off inside of you when you hear those damnable lies, and there is a flashing green light inside of you when you hear a a true preacher preach the truth of the Word of God the Holy Spirit inside of you is testifying. That is the truth. And we're referring to essential gospel issues. Like, if you don't believe this, you're not a Christian. You have to believe this if you're going to be a Christian. So, that's just putting our little toe into the water, and next time... I tell you what, I I can wrap this up. Let me just give you the last one real quick. Pastoral element. Oh, and we're three minutes fast on that. Okay, that's good because I'm three minutes slow. So, second main heading. I just want you to see this, the pastoral element. So, that's the polemic. That's what John is, is shooting at. That's what he's knocking the legs out from under. That's the rug he's pulling out from underneath the legs of a lot of people. The Gnostics. Now, the pastoral element is he wants to help the true believers have a true assurance of salvation. So, how do you know that you're really saved? Is it because you walked an aisle? Is it because you raised a hand? Is it because you signed a card? Is it because you joined a church? Is it because you were baptized? Do you know none of those things are mentioned in 1 John? Zero. A lot of those didn't even start until the 19th century. John will now give us nine evidences of the new birth. 
and all nine will be present in the life of a true believer. This is not a multiple choice, and you get to pick your favorite three out of the nine. All nine will be produced in your life, some more than others, and some in your life more than in other believers' lives, but nevertheless, categorically, all nine. And as you look at your life and you see these being produced in your life, you may know God lives inside of me. And God is at work inside of me. And the Holy Spirit is sanctifying me and maturing me and growing me into the image of Christ. And so here is the argument. I I want you to catch this. Most of you guys will get this. Regeneration and sanctification are inseparably bound together. Everyone who is regenerated is being sanctified. There's no firewall between those two. And sanctification began the moment you were regenerated. It's not something that happens 10 years down the road. My wife walked in last night as I was late last night in my study. She said, I've been meaning to ask you this for a long time. I can't believe that, that I haven't asked you this. She said, for years, you said you were converted, and she gave my young age. And she said, I heard you say from the pulpit in North Carolina that you were converted when you were 17. And for years, I had said I was converted as a young boy. She said, when did you change your testimony? I said, well, it's page one of my new book, (laughs) New Life in Christ. I said, (laughs) you obviously haven't read my book yet. (laughs) That's old news. It's not new news. The more I study the Bible... the more I realize my testimony needs to square up with the Bible. So when did my life change? Well, it was when I was 17. And when I heard a message on you must be born again. And the immediate impact that had on my life. You cannot meet the risen Christ and just go on your merry way. You cannot meet the risen Christ and your life be the same. You cannot meet the risen Christ and you not be dramatically transformed. If not, you have not met the risen Christ. He's too powerful. He has too much grace. The Holy Spirit is too intimate and indwelling from the inside for your life not to change. It just cannot happen. There's not a theological category to place you in. So even in what we're looking at here, you need to know. So what are the distinguishing marks of actually believing in Jesus Christ with a true saving faith? So that you're not one of those that just says, Lord, Lord, And Jesus says, I never knew you. Depart from me, you who work iniquity. All right, I'm just going to run through this very quickly. And and because we're going to start our journey next, next Thursday. Number one, you have to believe in the true Christ. That's chapter one, verses one through four. I'm not going to give you every single one of the references. Number two, you confess your sins. First John five through Two, verse 2. <laughs> you know, sometimes I have people come to me and they say, I must not be a Christian because I'm still sinning. And I say, well, the, the acid test is not do you sin. The acid test, the bottom line is, do you confess your sin? Or, or are you just happy about your sin? Do you just enjoy your sin? Or are you actually grieved by your sin? And do you actually... Confess it to God, because the true Christian is not someone who never sins. 
The true Christian is someone who confesses their sin, and they're bothered by their sin. Number three, obeying God's Word. A true Christian obeys God's Word, chapter 2, 3 through 6. Number four, loving the brethren, chapter 2, 7 through 11. Number five, rejecting the world, chapter 2, 15 through 17. You're no longer in the world. You burn those bridges behind you. You're in the world, but you're not of the world. You're no longer a part of the system. Number six, discerning the truth. You now have, and that's chapter 2, 18 to 27, you now have the ultimate teacher, capital T, inside of you, who is at work in you when a human teacher is presenting the truth. The Holy Spirit Spirit is taking it deeper into your soul. Number seven, practicing righteousness. It's chapter 2, 28 to chapter 3, verse 10. Every true Christian practices righteousness from the heart. Number eight, confidence before God. Chapter 3, 19 to 24. You don't dread God. You love God. And you have confidence that when you are before the throne of grace, you're home. That's my Father. And then number nine, answers to prayer. That's chapter 5, 14 to 17, and chapter 3, verse 22. We're, we're going to walk through every single one of these, and we're going to take our time. Because, if you can believe that, um, you laughed. <laughs> you know, I just believe deeper is better than shallower. And I want to get down into this with you. And, and I want to walk around in this book. And I want to know what this book says about real salvation. Not, not superficial salvation. Real salvation. And I want you to know that you're saved. I want you to know why you know you're saved. And I want you to know that you're not saved if you're not saved. Because no one can be saved until they, until they know they're lost. And so if you're not saved... I really want you to know that you're lost, not to be unkind, but just so we can bring you to the point where you can be saved, so that you would no longer be self-deceived. Well, man, this is where we're headed in this. This is one incredible book, and this is so different than Romans in the way that it goes about presenting the argument, in the vocabulary, in the way that it is said, and this book is probably the ultimate black and white book. There's just like no gray area in, in, in this book. And so I, I want you to walk through this book with me. I would just say this, if you are aware that you're not a Christian, then you may be a Christian. If you will confess your sin and turn to the Lord and believe in Him, and there should be nothing holding you back other than your own pride or ego, from committing your life to Christ. I'll tell you this, I have never once, I've been preaching for 52 years, I have never once ever heard anyone say, I am so sorry I gave my life to Christ. <laughs> I'd like a refund. <laughs> Everyone says, I don't know why I waited so long. I wish I had come to Christ earlier. And so, if you're not a Christian yet, don't wait any longer. Do it now. You can do it right now, just in the quietness of your heart. Commit your life to Christ. Say, Lord Jesus, save me. I'm a sinner. You're a Savior. Save me. All right, let me close in a word of prayer. I know I've gone kind of long, and anyone who wants to stay for... Any kind of Q&A or question, you're welcome to stay. You can stay where you are, gather around the table. Others of you need to head out. 
for your golf match. So uh, <laughs> let me pray. Father, where would we be without the Bible? Where would we be without knowing the truth? Thank you for loving us so much that you have given us the record of truth, and it has endured through the ages, through the centuries, and it speaks to us today just as relevant, just as powerful as when it was first written at the end of the first century. So, Lord, bless these men. Make this study the study of a lifetime. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, men, thank you so much for being here. <clears throat> and Kent says, all coffee is on the house for the next five seconds. Okay. So <laughs>